Out of all the reasons I identify as a theist, two reasons that almost never come to mind are the cosmological and teleological arguments. Though these arguments have a degree of validity, I would say that their track record is fairly poor. For the cosmological argument, Sean Carroll brilliantly shows why a necessary being needed to cause the Big Bang is not really necessary at all, given certain theories about quantum physics. And nearly every YouTube atheist has also bought up various issues with the teleological argument, from the lack of evidence for guided evolution to the perpetual chaos and suffering in our world, which stands in opposition of an intelligent designer. And yet, I still identify as a theist because neither of these arguments matter in the grand scheme of things. That's because the vast majority of YouTube atheists and skeptics tend to attack a very specific brand of theistic arguments, the ones derived from Aristotle and Thomas Aquinas. But these arguments weren't commonly used in traditional pre-Abrahamic theological circles. In fact, the greatest, most infallible argument for deity was crafted by one of the most insightful and divine teachers in human history, the Greek philosopher Plato. In this video, I'll be showing how Plato's theory of forms functions as an ontological argument that shows that all of being is grounded in an immaterial, hyperpotent, transcendent, intellectual first principle, or what many are referring to when they talk about God. A quick side note before I start, since Platonism is a polytheistic faith, we have to remember that God can be understood as a single divine intellect, or as a succession of multiple intelligible beings. God's immateriality makes it impossible for hard polytheism or exclusive monotheism to exist. God must be both one and many at the same time, and yet each god is unique in their oneness and unity. I'll be making a separate video on why Platonism transcends the debate of polytheism and monotheism, but for now, I'll be using exclusively monotheistic language in this video to keep things simple. All that being said, let's dive into Plato's ontological argument for the existence of God. Before I get into the nitty gritty, let's chart out all of the logical steps of this argument. We'll revisit all of these at the very end. I'll post a simplified version of this argument at the end of the video so that everyday people can recite it to their skeptical friends. Here we go. Step 1. Material reality exists. Step 2. Individual material objects exist. Step 3. Individual material objects are unique from one another because they have a material form. Step 4. Material forms are predicated on ideal forms. Step 5. Ideal forms are most easily proven through mathematical constants. Each mathematical constant is an ideal form. Step 6. Since mathematical constants are not arbitrary but are deduced through observation, they exist independently and ideally as opposed to purely nominalistically or subjectively. Step 7. Since mathematical constants exist independently and function as a cause for the forms of material objects, they are metaphysical and do not have physicalist causes. Step 8. If each ideal form is metaphysical, infinite, and pattern-based, then the property shared between all forms includes infinitude, intellect, and being, since every ideal form is endless, contains a logical inferable pattern, and exists. Step 9. If infinitude, intellect, and being are the ideals that all forms share in common with each other, then they are the cause of those ideal forms, and exist independently, just as the ideal forms do with material forms. Step 10. Since we have now logically deduced the existence of infinitude, intellect, and being as independent ideals, then the indescribable property they share in common as their cause is what we would call God, the highest ontological principle of being. Now that we have everything graphed out, let's analyze and go through each point. Point 1. Material reality exists. Unless you're a solipsist, this point should be one that we all agree on without need for elaboration. Moving on. Point 2. Individual material objects exist. Similar to the previous point, this one shouldn't have to be debated. But if we want to be skeptical as to what counts as an individual object, let's just keep in mind that if objects were only nominalistically individuated, then our act of individuating them would be entirely arbitrary or simply informed by social cues. However, since a water bottle is different from a desk due to entirely physicalist causes, such as the differences in atoms between the two objects, we can verify that individuation is not nominal but truly legitimate. Things differ from each other, whether we want them to or not. Moving on. 
Point three, individual material objects are unique from one another because they have a material form. The previous point hammered in the fact that different objects contain different molecular compounds, thus causing them to be different regardless of our personal perception. This point is similar except now we are referring to the shape, size, and utilization of these objects. Compare a tree to a lizard. The tree's form causes it to take a certain shape, with certain natural functions such as absorbing sunlight for food production, and so on. Compare that to a lizard. Lizards have legs, they crawl, and they eat food through their mouths. The point is, the differences here are greater than just comparing lizard molecules to tree molecules. The entirety of unity that is the tree is different from that of the lizard. They have separate forms. Point four, material forms are predicated on ideal forms. How else could any one thing be different from any other thing at all? We've already demonstrated that physical entities are not nominalistic or purely subjective. Since the act of naming things requires a consensus on the consistent qualities of that particular thing, these qualities exist outside of our observation. If everything is nominal, why has no one ever confused gas giant planets with crows? In other words, what is causing the difference-ness between the various objects? Platonists argue that causal differentiation is its own thing. We call these ideal forms. Planets participate in the ideal form of roundness and largeness, while crows participate in the ideal forms of smallness and sentient beingness. And those are just a few of the forms which make the two objects recognizably different from each other. Without the forms, everything would be the same. Nothing would have quality. Point five, ideal forms are most easily proven through mathematical constants. Each mathematical constant is an ideal form. Take a circle. Now, we know that a circle is objectively different from, say, the Fibonacci sequence. The circle's circumference in relation to its diameter is pi, which is an infinite number. That is exactly what we would expect if mathematics uncovered an ideal form. The number quantifying that form would, in fact, be eternal. If we look at another form, such as the Fibonacci sequence, this is also the case. Both mathematical constants are infinite, and yet, both constants accurately describe physical shadows that we see in the real world, such as the roundness of a planet or the shape of a galaxy. The infinite constants that physical objects participate in are the ideal forms. Since we've proven the existence of these forms through the existence of mathematical constants, this also satisfies point six of our proof. Point seven, since mathematical constants exist independently and function as a cause for the forms of material objects, they are metaphysical and do not have physicalist causes. This explains it all. We just equated mathematical constants with ideal forms. Can you touch a mathematical constant? Can you run experiments on it? Can you put it in a test tube? Nope, they're intangible causal realities. This makes them metaphysical because despite their immateriality, they do have an effect on the world around us. This is starting to sound more and more like God. Moving on. Point eight. If each ideal form is metaphysical, infinite, and pattern-based, then the property shared between all forms includes infinitude, intellect, and being, since every ideal form is endless, contains a logical inferable pattern, and exists. Think about it. What do the forms of circle and the forms of Fibonacci sequence have in common? They are both eternal. Since even the forms participate in eternity, eternity must be a form in of itself that the forms participate in. Otherwise, they would lack the quality of eternity and cease to be ideal forms. Eternity must be metaphysical since it is the cause of already metaphysically existent forms. See point nine. And yet this eternity is also a causal agent for the world we see around us. Since it is causal in mathematical, non-arbitrary ways, this would fit the definition of an intellectual agent. We also cannot say that this apparent intellectualism occurred merely by chance, since randomness is a product of certain mathematical constants, and we cannot attribute the source of these constants to the things they generate. That is a paradox. Therefore, the forms are eternal and intellectual. If eternity and intellect exist on their own for the forms to participate in, then they exist as forms in of themselves. And since the forms exist, being as a thing in of itself also exists. Exists, since the forms participate in being through their very existence. Point 10. Since we have now logically deduced the existence of infinitude, intellect, and being as independent principles, then the indescribable property they share in common as their cause is what we would call God, since this property would be an ontological fountain of infinitude intellect and being, which seems an appropriate definition for God. This point pretty much explains it all. God is the ontological source of being, intellect, and infinitude. 
No matter if we descend or ascend the ladder of being, God always seems to come out on top. Now, many of you might be wondering, is this Yahweh? The answer is no. Thomas Aquinas tried his best to equate personal attributable theism with actus purus or divine simplicity as I've defined it here, but failed since the two are irreconcilable. So what we have here is not Yahweh, but something even simpler, what Plotinus correctly calls the one. And this is why we should all be Platonists. Now, I've decided to save the case for polytheism for a different video. However, this version of Plato's theory of forms as an ontological argument also proves the existence of countless deities. In fact, that is the logical conclusion. But we'll put that aside for now. Let me know what you all think in the comments below. And thanks for watching.